gateway to America. Home to Wall Street, Broadway, Times Square has come a long way. It was born 400 years ago, a small Dutch outpost, cut off from the American mainland by powerful rivers thousands of feet wide. The East River, the Hudson, the Narrows. Spanning this gulf once seemed an impossible challenge until a series of unprecedented bridges conquered these waters. It took vision, brute strength, technological savvy, and the lives of dozens of men to build these nine bridges. This is their story. Now, go inside the bridges of New York. Today, over eight million people are jammed into the 300 square miles of New York City. With its crown jewel, Manhattan, the city has the highest population density in America. But just 400 years ago, this concrete jungle was nothing but a small Dutch trading outpost on the tip of Manhattan. They called it New Amsterdam. 200 years later, New Amsterdam had become New York and its population had exploded to over 60,000. But it's surrounded by vast rivers. The East River on one side, the Hudson River to the west. To become a major city like London or Paris, it needed to be able to grow. The time had come. New York was about to undertake one of the largest engineering projects the world had ever known. It's almost impossible to imagine New York City having become the New York City we know without the bridges. They make it one city, these five boroughs. They bring them all together. They're truly arteries that keep the city alive. There are more than 2,000 bridges in New York City today. But this one may be the most famous. The Brooklyn Bridge. New York, mid-1860s. The gun smoke of the Civil War has just started to clear. Manhattan, with over 800,000 people, is already home to the biggest city in the country. But many New Yorkers prefer to just work there and live across the East River in the city of Brooklyn. Every day, more than 100,000 New Yorkers travel between Brooklyn and Manhattan. But the only way across the river is by ferries that routinely get frozen in winter ice. Commuters need a permanent, reliable way to get to their jobs in New York. They demand a bridge. But there's a problem. The bridge will have to span more than 1,000 feet across the East River without blocking the shipping channel that connects New York with the world. The East River was an important waterway, and if you wanted large ships to be able to use it, you couldn't sink a stone bridge right in the center of it. That means building a suspension bridge. The genius of a suspension bridge is that you can hang the bridge from above, but then, of course, that raises a whole new set of challenges. How do you hang a bridge from above? Well, you have to begin with towers. Engineers use huge towers on either end of the bridge to suspend a flat roadway from arcing cables, which are encased in 60,000 ton stone blocks called anchorages on either shore. Smaller cables called suspenders hang down from the main cables and hold up the roadway. The heavy weight of the road pulls down on the cables, but the anchorages keep the cables pulled taut, holding the road up. The combined forces push down on the towers, compressing them into a solid, rigid mass. Since the towers, cables, and anchorages do all the work of holding up the roadway, additional pillars underneath aren't needed, keeping the river clear. It's an ingenious way to make a bridge, and it also sort of seems to defy nature because there doesn't seem to be any way that it's being held up. Before now, no one has dared use these engineering marvels to cross a river this wide. The Brooklyn Bridge's center span will need to be over 1,500 feet, 50% longer than any suspension bridge ever built, connecting City Hall in Manhattan with downtown Brooklyn. 
It seems like an impossible job, but one man in America is up to the challenge, a civil engineer named John Augustus Roebling. Even at one of the river's narrowest points, the bridge will require a center span that will stretch a staggering 1,595 and a half feet. He will need 14,000 miles of wire to make the four main cables it hangs from. To hold all that up, he designs towers of stone, taller than almost every building in the city. But then, tragedy strikes. In 1869, while making final sightings for the bridge, Roebling's foot is crushed by a ferry slamming into its slip. His toes are amputated, and he dies soon after of an infection. One of the largest engineering projects ever attempted is in turmoil. But salvation is found close to home. His son, Washington A. Roebling, must take his father's place as chief engineer. Finally, the massive effort is ready to begin. On January 3rd, 1870, the first of a workforce that would reach nearly 1,000 men report to duty. Their first challenge is to erect the massive Gothic arches that will one day become one of the bridge's most iconic features. But their foundations must rest on solid ground at river bottom to be sturdy. That means Roebling must somehow send men up to 80 feet underwater to dig away the riverbed down to bedrock. Roebling turns to a risky new device, an open-bottomed box of wood and iron called a caisson. Pneumatic caissons are basically large boxes that are placed upside down so that what would normally be the bottom of a box is up at the top and the open bottom is facing down into the water. Sunk to the bottom of the river, highly pressurized air is pumped into the open area, forcing the water out. Men climb inside through airlocks to work in the cramped, pressurized space. Some compare it to hell, unbearably hot and humid, in danger from both fire and drowning. Men spend a year toiling in these caissons, digging away at a rate of more than a foot per day at the riverbed beneath them. It was a challenge like no one had ever taken on before. Every day they would go down there through airlocks and dig with picks and shovels and slowly but surely go down through the riverbed down to bedrock. But the pressurized air that keeps the water out also leads to a mysterious sickness. Over a hundred fall ill. Three men die. Even Washington Roebling himself suffers a crippling attack. They call it caisson disease, or the bends. But the cause is unknown. Doctors won't discover that rapid decompression during the climb back to the surface is to blame for six more years. And the work must continue. You took your life in your hands when you went to work. These were high-risk jobs, but there was also that sense of adventure. You might have been just the guy digging in the dirt, but you were still part of a team that was creating the first bridge that's going to cross the East River. Men shoveled the dirt of the riverbed into shafts inside the caisson. Scoops from the surface hauled the debris up to barges. As the caisson slowly descends through the riverbed, granite tower blocks are laid row by row on top of it. When it reaches bedrock a year later in 1872, it is filled with concrete, forming the foundation for the tower. At a pace of 20 blocks per hour, the stone towers are built to a height of 276 and a half feet. The only thing in town taller is the spire of Trinity Church on Wall Street. Slowly, the towers climb into the New York skyline. Finally, after six years of backbreaking work, they are done. Now, Roebling must suspend 18,700 tons of roadway from four massive cables. Roebling wants to gamble on an untested material called steel, which proves 75% stronger than iron. But it has never been used in bridge cables before. Roebling hit a home run with that decision. And it has to be acknowledged that he didn't make that decision because it was fashionable or the best engineers 
at the day were making that decision because they weren't. But each main cable must be made almost 16 inches thick. The only way to manufacture them is to combine smaller steel wires together. And each of those wires must be long enough to reach from one shore to the other over the towers. More than 3,500 miles of continuous wire are needed in total. To make it all, individual pieces of steel wire have to be combined into one endless loop. And of course, the wire is manufactured in lengths of uh, a few thousand feet, but in order to make it a longer continuous wire, it has to be spliced together. This is an example of a spliced bridge wire. Um, it's done by using what we call a press-on ferrule. The both ends of the wire are inserted into the ferrule. The ferrule has a hardened wire, a hardened steel insert in there. Once both ends are inserted, a hydraulic press is used to squeeze it tight, and that develops uh, basically the full strength of the wire. Over 5,000 smaller steel wires will be used to make each cable. It's very difficult to make large wires very strong, but it's very easy to make small wires very strong. So if you want a big cable, you have to make it up of a lot and lot of small wires. This actually is a wire from one of the main cables of a bridge. You can actually see it's almost impossible to bend this little wire. They're very, very strong. Men will gather groups of wires into bundles called strands and then compress them into a cylinder to make one cable. Each finished cable will weigh close to two million pounds. There's no way to lift something that heavy up to the tops of the towers, so Roebling devises a way to assemble the cables in midair. One by one, he strings each steel wire from shore to shore in a process called spinning. This innovative new technique dramatically improved suspension bridge building technology. Here's the idea behind cable spinning. So imagine that this is a reel of bridge wire, and our anchorage is here. The spinning wheel is on a tramway similar to a ski lift, and it goes from one anchorage to the other. So the wire is looped around the spinning wheel, and then as the spinning wheel is brought across the bridge, it brings out the loop, the, the, the wire. And this is done repeatedly until the multiple thousands of wires are in place that make up the final cable. It takes two years to spin the 21,128 steel wires from anchorage to anchorage across the towers. Enough wire to stretch from New York to London and back twice. Finally, the road of the bridge can be built. In the final step, the metal frames for the five-lane road deck are clamped to suspender cables hung from the main cables. This is a piece of wire rope. This is actually a piece of the original, an original suspender from the Brooklyn Bridge. And as you can see, it's made up of, in this case, seven strands that are twisted. The, the outer six are twisted around the central strand. Each one of these strands is made up of a number of individual wires which are twisted around a central wire. But we actually call this a wire rope as opposed to the main cables which are parallel wires and are not twisted at all. Fourteen years after construction began, the longest suspension bridge in the world is complete. It is occasion for a national celebration. 6,000 people turn out on opening day, May 24, 1883, and Chester A. Arthur, the President of the United States, shows up to lead the celebration. Here was the symbolic joining of two cities, Brooklyn and New York. It's the beginning of the consolidation of the boroughs into the single city of New York. The Brooklyn Bridge is what starts New York into becoming the city we think of it today. New York's first permanent link to its neighbor energizes Brooklyn. Property values soar. Brooklyn's population explodes towards 800,000, double what it was before construction began. Soon 150,000 people are clogging the new bridge each day. New York needs more bridges to the heart of Manhattan to meet the demand. But it took 14 years to build the Brooklyn Bridge. The continued growth of the city depends on finding a way to quickly build more.
Now, go back inside the bridges of New York. Today, the promenade of the Brooklyn Bridge is as popular as it ever was. But unlike when it first opened, you don't have to pay a one cent toll to cross it. New York, 1890s. The Brooklyn Bridge has finally given Lower Manhattan its first permanent link to Brooklyn. Tens of thousands of commuters cross the new bridge each day. Some walking, some in horse-drawn carriages, others in trolleys. Overloading the bridge's five lanes with traffic. Brooklyn's population tops 800,000, more than triple what it was just three decades ago. And neighboring communities, the Bronx, Staten Island, and Queens, are jealous of Brooklyn's growth and prosperity. 1896, New York is about to embark on a bridge-building frenzy. The Brooklyn Bridge was proof of concept. Now you had a template that showed how you could do it. Now the only question is, how do we do it better and cheaper the next time? The next bridge to Manhattan will be built from Williamsburg, a couple of miles north from the heart of Brooklyn to Delancey Street on Manhattan's Lower East Side. Because the five-lane Brooklyn Bridge is already overwhelmed by traffic, engineers designed nine lanes for the new bridge. Six for railroads and trolleys, two for carriages, and one for pedestrians. The Brooklyn Bridge took 14 years to build. But time is money. Building a bigger and stronger bridge in less time is a daunting challenge. Once again, engineers turn to the amazing new power of steel to get the job done. Unlike the Brooklyn Bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge will have towers made entirely of steel. The first ever. Because of steel's superior strength, less of it will be needed, making the towers lighter. And lighter steel towers can stand on smaller foundations, which are quicker to build. Steel became more economical, uh, became more trustworthy, and by the time the Williamsburg Bridge came along, bridge engineers knew that it worked and that it was the way to go. The metal towers will climb 350 feet into the sky, 73 and a half feet taller than the dense stone arches of the Brooklyn Bridge. Steel makes it possible for them to meet that height using less material and at less cost without sacrificing strength. On the Brooklyn Bridge, cables hold up the roadways leading up to both towers as well as the center span. This time, engineers design steel arches called viaducts to hold the side spans up from below. Now the cables only have to suspend the weight of the center span and can be made smaller and lighter. Because the approaches on the Williamsburg Bridge do not depend on the suspension cables for support, but rather are supported underneath, it allows you to build a thinner and more graceful cable than you would if you had that additional load. Construction begins on November 7, 1896. Over 4,000 tons of steel wire is spun into cables. The bridge's nine lanes are hung from them on two levels, one above the other. This gives engineers an advantage, a natural way to make the bridge stronger. There is an added benefit to having two decks because it automatically forces the designer to design a box shape. And a box is much more rigid and stiff when compared to any type of a, a single type of deck. The box shape is made by connecting the two levels of road with a simple series of steel beams, forming a truss. A, a truss is an arrangement of material. Usually it's in the shape of diagonals, of triangles, which provide a great deal of rigidity and strength to the roadbed, but it doesn't add so much weight. Those pieces that are in it are arranged in such a way that they're getting the maximum strength with the minimum amount of steel. The Williamsburg Bridge is finished in just seven years, half the time it took to build the Brooklyn Bridge. Four and a half feet longer, it also steals the Brooklyn Bridge's record for longest suspension bridge in the world. 
By 1900, Brooklyn and Manhattan are each home to over one million people and two bridges. Farther north, the population of the isolated borough of Queens barely breaks 150,000. But a new bridge project, the Queensboro, is about to inject life into the remote community straight from the heart of Midtown New York. And its location will allow New York to build this bridge on the cheap. The trouble with the East River is it's very wide and there's no places to touch down. You have to cross it all in one shot. But when you get to the Queensboro location, here's a piece of land down at the bottom, right in the middle of the span. Wow, does that make things easier. Roosevelt Island allows engineers to turn to a different, cheaper bridge building technology, the cantilever. A cantilever is a structure that juts out beyond its supports. I think the, the simplest way to imagine a cantilever is think of a diving board. The end of a diving board is cantilevered out beyond its supports. A cantilever bridge is very similar to a couple of diving boards turned around to face each other where the two arms come out and meet. Unlike a suspension bridge that is hung from above, a cantilever bridge can be made by projecting beams outward from its towers over the water. Like a seesaw, the arm hanging over the water is balanced by an arm built in the other direction. But there is a limit to how far one cantilevered arm can reach. It can't span the river without coming to rest in between. Roosevelt Island solves that problem. Construction begins in 1901, and for the next six years, over 70,000 tons of steel are used to build the arms of the bridge out over the water until they are ready to be connected. This is a report from the original construction of the Queensboro Bridge. 1908, and this shows the general layout of the bridge. The cantilever arms are built piece by piece and are extended out over to the river. Once they meet in the middle of the span, they were linked together with a truss member. Queens's population will soon double to 300,000. But three million people already live in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Before either the Queensboro or the Williamsburg Bridge is even finished, a fourth bridge to the boroughs, the Manhattan Bridge, is going up just a few blocks northeast of the Brooklyn Bridge to meet the demand. Again, our physical situation mandated that. Um, we needed the bridges to link the boroughs together. Can you imagine living in New York City between the years 1900 and 1910, when you have three of the longest bridges in the world going up side by side on the East River? It must have just been an extraordinary sight. But if engineers keep building big, bulky bridges, they'll never get done quickly enough to keep up with the growth of the city. And between bridges and skyscrapers, construction crews all over the city are facing shortages of steel. New York is looking for ways to build suspension bridges quicker and more economically. New York City will now be the setting for a daring experiment. A radical new engineering principle called deflection theory that will cut down on the amount of steel needed to build the bridge. Why do we have to stabilize what essentially is a very rigid structure already? The beauty of deflection theory is it taught us that there's so much weight hanging from <laughs> these things that they are essentially pretty rigid. The heavier the road of a suspension bridge gets, the stiffer it and the cables it hangs from become. It doesn't need the heavy, extra stiffening trusses like those used on the Williamsburg Bridge. Basically, if the bridge is long enough and heavy enough, the weight of the bridge will sort of act as its own truss by keeping the roadbed rigid and level. You can build longer and longer spans using less and less steel, which really was quite a revelation to bridge engineers. Good engineers are always trying to figure out ways to use less material and get more bang for the buck. The Manhattan Bridge will be the first big experiment in deflection theory. Construction begins in 1901. Its towers are built super thin, almost two-dimensional in comparison with the thicker towers of the Brooklyn and Williamsburg bridges. If you look at the Manhattan Bridge and compare it to, say, the Williamsburg Bridge, 
the Manhattan Bridge stiffening trusses are much shallower. The towers are more slender and flexible, and that's a product of designing using the deflection theory. On New Year's Eve 1909, New York rings in a new decade by opening a cutting-edge suspension bridge. Engineers now believe they can build bridges of unprecedented length. The advent of deflection theory was going to permit probably another doubling of the length of suspension bridges. With all four East River bridges finally in operation and armed with a new method of building bridges, New York turns its attention to conquering the mighty river to its west. The ultimate test of deflection theory is lurking on the other side of Manhattan, the Hudson River. Now, go back inside the bridges of New York. Brooklyn, Williamsburg, Queensboro, Manhattan. Today, over half a million vehicles cross New York's four East River bridges on an average workday. But not long after they opened, engineers had their sights set on another challenge across town. New York City, the Roaring Twenties. In the aftermath of the First World War, the city is thriving. Four bridges crossing the East River have solidified Manhattan's bond with Brooklyn and Queens. It seems there is nothing that can't be done. But the west side of Manhattan lies unconquered. It was clear that the Hudson had to be crossed at some point. I mean, that was the mainland over there. The Hudson is 3,500 feet wide three times as long as the East River. So, boy oh boy, this is a different deal. Suspending a road that far will be like hanging 15 city blocks in midair. Two Brooklyn bridges spanned end to end wouldn't make it across. Much as conquering the East River had been the challenge for the 19th century engineer, the Hudson River stood there for the 20th century engineer. It was said that every engineer in the United States had a design in his pocket for a bridge to cross the Hudson River. 18 different conventional bridge designs are submitted. Most are too heavy and expensive. None make it to construction. Bridging the Hudson seems impossible. But one engineer named Othmar Amman believes the solution already exists, deflection theory. What the deflection theory actually gave to the engineers was a better understanding of the behavior of a suspension bridge. And when you took that into account, the engineer was then able to streamline his design in order to reduce some of the weight onto the bridge and therefore actually increase their span lengths. Engineers who designed bridges without deflection theory added extra structures like stay cables and heavy trusses to stabilize them. Amman is confident that he can build 3,500 feet of roadway without those extra supports. It will be light enough to stretch all the way to New Jersey, but still heavy enough to stabilize itself. The result will be the George Washington Bridge. Amund's design for the George Washington Bridge really pushed the limits of the deflection theory. You can see his use of the deflection theory in the fact that it's quite slender looking compared to the span. And you can see that the art of bridge design engineering has changed. Construction on New York's six-lane steel link to the rest of the American continent begins in October 1927. Workers struggle to erect steel towers 604 feet into the sky, higher than most of the city's skyscrapers. The job that they did was something that is inconceivable to most of us. They worked hundreds of feet over the river and had no safety protections whatsoever at that time. They were almost literally hanging by the seat of their pants up there. I don't know how anybody did it. The first time I walked on a suspension bridge cable, I looked down and the cable was as wide as my foot was long, and I guess I felt a little flutter in my stomach and said, uh, okay, let's go. And after the first step or two, uh, it became second nature. It's, uh, it's very enjoyable. The original plan calls for the towers to be encased in concrete for extra strength, but Amon soon changes his mind. 
If you look at the bridge today, what we celebrate about this bridge, the cross hatching, the aesthetics, the linear feel, would have been hidden by granite sheathing. We came to realize as time went on that the steel didn't need any more support. It was plenty strong to hold up the bridge. The George Washington Bridge is completed eight months ahead of schedule and for less than the estimated price tag of $60 million. And it doubles the record for the longest suspension bridge in the world. There's never been a leap in bridge technology to match what Omar Amman did with the George Washington Bridge. That was an unabashed triumph. The George Washington Bridge gives commerce a new route through Manhattan around the traffic jams of the city. But right from the start, the triumph of the bridge creates traffic jams of its own. On opening day, October 25, 1931, more than 56,000 cars cross the Hudson. Within a few years, it becomes clear that the bridge will be overwhelmed. But Othmar Amman had seen that the automobile was the wave of the future, and he planned ahead. The visionary had built his bridge with a groundbreaking capacity for expansion. The main cables, the towers, the foundations, the anchorages were all designed with the knowledge that at a point later in time a second deck would be erected uh, and would carry six additional more lanes on the structure. In 1962, an entire second level of roadway is added underneath the first, nearly doubling capacity. 76 pieces of prefabricated road sections are raised into position, section by section. So these pieces were hauled up from the water below, from barges below, and then bolted into place, connected to the existing floor beams. So piece by piece, they were lifted up into place. I mean, it's kind of an amazing testament to the strength of this thing, and to the genius of Omar Amman, that you could hang an entirely new bridge from them, and it caused no noticeable stress. 75 years after it first opened, the George Washington Bridge still has the greatest capacity of any bridge in the world. More than 107 million vehicles crossed its 14 lanes in 2005 alone. And if that's the goal of a bridge, is to facilitate land transport across a particular body of water, then the George Washington Bridge has to be judged the most successful suspension bridge in history. The George Washington Bridge forever changes the city. Manhattan has a permanent link to the rest of the American continent. But inside the engineering refinements that made it possible lies a deadly flaw. Now, go back inside the bridges of New York. Even on a cloudy day, the towers of the George Washington Bridge, 604 feet high, provide an unmatched view of New York City. Each arch alone is 17 stories high and weighs 20,000 tons. Back in 1929, as Othmar Amman was finishing this massive bridge, the city was turning its attention to yet another ambitious bridge building project. Three of New York's five boroughs now have major bridges into the city center, but the Bronx remains isolated to the northeast. It's cut off from the prosperity Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens share across their bridges. So engineers decide to link the Bronx to all of them at once. It will be called the Triborough Bridge. And it was going to connect Queens, the Bronx, and New York. And not only is it connecting three distinct entities, but it's using different kinds of technology and engineering to do it all at once. The first two bridges are relatively simple. A lift bridge is built across the Harlem River to Manhattan. A small truss bridge connects with it to the Bronx. But the greatest challenge is building the suspension bridge from Queens, stretching over the East River. Construction on it begins on Friday, October 25th, 1929. And later that day, the New York Stock Exchange crashes. By 1932, the country is in the midst of the Great Depression. They actually built foundations for both the towers and the anchorages, and then the money dried up. The Triborough project is abandoned, 
simplifying the suspension bridge's design is the only chance to bring it back from the dead. Building bridges during the Depression created some really great engineering challenges because there was no money. And they hired O.H. Ahman, who had just completed his work at the GW, to take this existing design and revise it in order to be able to build this bridge within the budget. Ahman takes over in 1934. He finds the design for the suspension bridge calls for many unnecessary and expensive elements. And as you can see, the original design called for four main cables to be utilized, and subsequently the towers had four main tower legs, and you'll note the gothic appearance of the towers and the arches that were employed in the original design. That was all changed. Ahmed quickly goes about simplifying the design. He collapses two levels of road into just one. And that single roadway can be held aloft by half as many main cables. Now the towers can stand on just two legs. Their intricate Gothic details are replaced with a simpler, streamlined, modern look. Amman saves over 10 million on the towers alone. An average of 1,000 men work each day for three years to build the slimmed down suspension bridge. Thanks to Amman's drastic cuts, the Triborough Bridge finally opens on July 11, 1936. Residents of the Bronx now have direct access to both Upper Manhattan and Long Island. New suburban communities are born and thrive farther away from the heart of the city. And Othmar Amman has refined the process of building streamlined bridges a step further. It doesn't take as long to build a simple bridge as it does to build something that's highly ornamented. And this is what's going to be happening when we start with the Triborough and the later bridges that are being constructed in and around New York City. Amman designs very simply to eliminate unnecessary elements. You can see the progression of his simplicity in design. In 1935, his designs are put to the test. The World's Fair is coming to Queens, and the city needs a bridge to funnel tourists from New England directly to the Bronx. The Bronx Whitestone Bridge is commissioned, but the exhibition is only four years away. The Bronx Whitestone Bridge, with its very short time scale, pushed along the evolution of suspension bridge design. What can we do without? There's nothing like a tight time schedule to make everybody sit down and say, what's really a luxury and what do we really need? You don't see the big cross bracings that you saw on other suspension bridge designs, and this really gave a slender look to his structures. But when he went to the Bronx Whitestone, it became clearly evident. He utilized a simple arch element at the top of the tower to provide bracing. Amund's bridge rises at a breakneck pace. 377 feet tall, men race to build each tower in only 18 days, and then spin 14,800 miles of wire across them to make suspension cables in a record 41 days. The bridge opens the day before the World's Fair begins, on April 30th, 1939. But motorists crossing it soon notice something strange. The bridge has an unnerving tendency to move in high winds. One year later, strong winds bring Washington State's Tacoma Narrows Bridge crashing down. The, the idea of doing more with less was always a driving impulse. But it went too far. We recognized that we had reached our limit, how efficient we could use the material and not run the risk of making the bridge so flexible that it couldn't stay stiff in the wind. The, the Bronx Whitestone Bridge was designed somewhat similar to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It was moving up and down similar to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, but not as severely. Amon is forced to retrofit his bridge. At first, they actually attached stay cables from the towers down to the stiffening girders and those are actually still in place. You can see them on the bridge. This didn't significantly retard this motion or these oscillations, and they embarked on a contract in the 40s to place a stiffening truss on top of the existing girder. But today, those trusses are gone. They are removed in 2003 and replaced with reinforced fiberglass fairings. 
These aerodynamic structures allow wind to flow over the bridge easily, rather than push against it. We don't have to make the bridge stiffer to resist the force because we shape the deck so that the forces are not created. They don't exist. So that's a different concept altogether. From the beginning, the Bronx Whitestone provides a vital link to the heart of the city for commerce from America's Northeast. So vital that another bridge is built from Throg's Neck in the Bronx to Bayside, Queens to satisfy the demand. The Throg's Neck Bridge opens on January 11, 1961. This is something that is always challenging New York. You know, you build a bridge, it's successful. It's so successful that so many people use it. Now you've got to build another one. The Throg's Neck is New York City's first new long-span bridge in almost 20 years. New York seems to build its greatest bridges in spurts and fits. The Brooklyn Bridge touched off the city's growth in the 1880s. Two decades later, three bridges went up over the East River between 1900 and 1910 as the city boomed. Another two decades later, three more great bridges opened in the 1930s as the city expanded outward. And two more decades after that, it seems the city has grown enough to be ready for another round of construction. With each bridge that's constructed in New York, engineers are building on the success or sometimes the failure of the bridge that came before it. They're looking of how can you improve the look, how can you can improve the functionality, can you make it bigger, can you make it longer, can it carry more cars, and they're looking for the ultimate bridge. But while the Throg's Neck Bridge is going up between the Bronx and Queens, all eyes are focused on Staten Island cut off from the other boroughs by more than 4,000 feet of water. Engineering theories, techniques, and materials have finally advanced enough to attempt the unthinkable. The longest suspension bridge in human history is about to bring the last of New York City's five boroughs into the fold. Now, go back inside the bridges of New York. 1959, four of the city's five boroughs have been connected. New York is almost whole. But Staten Island remains isolated from the other boroughs, separated by almost a mile of water. It's three times the size of Manhattan. But its 225,000 residents still depend on ferries to get directly to the city. By connecting Brooklyn and Staten Island, a bridge will give commerce a route to the northeast around the heavy traffic in Manhattan. But New Yorkers have been talking about this plan for 70 years. The distance appears too great. It was really an extraordinary undertaking to try to attach Brooklyn to Staten Island. And uh, nothing like this had ever really been done. Let's face it, we're talking about the largest suspension bridge that's ever going to be built. The longest center span in history. So you're about to extend all the known principles and experience one more notch out. New York turns to the man who designed every major suspension bridge in the city since the George Washington Bridge three decades earlier, Othmar Amman. The bridge will require a 4,260-foot clear span. It will also require enough concrete to build a single-lane highway from New York to Washington, D.C. This was really a monumental undertaking. This was going to be the longest suspension bridge in the world, but it also was going to be constructed in one of the busiest ports of the world. Construction begins in August 1959. Amman is instantly confronted with the usual challenges, but he has modern manufacturing on his side. Instead of men risking their lives digging foundations deep inside caissons, cranes safely scoop up the riverbed from the surface through a honeycomb of 66 vertical shafts. For the 693-foot tall towers, 20,000 prefabricated steel cells, each 40 feet tall, are manufactured off-site to precise measurements so they will fit together seamlessly. 
High above the water, they are assembled like a giant metal jigsaw puzzle. One box connects to the next box and to the next box. And then these are stacked one on top of the other. They are riveted together and then just stacked up until the entire tower is created. You're not just building a bridge, but you have to build a couple very big skyscrapers for towers out of steel to hold it up. And it just represents an enormous engineering challenge. But the biggest challenge engineers face is the distance. 4,260 feet between the towers. It creates its own unique set of problems. To give you a good understanding of just how long this bridge was, so although each tower is built perfectly perpendicular, perfectly plumb, they are one in five-eighths inch further apart at the top than they are at the bottom. And that's due to the curvature of the Earth and the fact that they are on radial lines pointing towards the center of the Earth. That becomes actually something that has to be taken into account when you erect the cables, for example. And this is actually shown by the engineers in the original drawings, showing that there was approximately a one and five eighth inch difference between the location of the top of the tower and the bottom of the tower. So the towers are actually vertical to the earth and not necessarily parallel to each other. 142,500 miles of galvanized steel, enough to wrap around the earth almost six times, is strung across the towers to make the four main cables. The Verrazano Narrows bridge cables are three feet in diameter. It's like walking up a, a sidewalk. All that wire is needed to hold up the enormous 12 lanes of roadway. Streamlined as much as possible, each of the 66 steel sections of road deck still weighs 400 tons. The longest bridge on the planet had once again been built in New York. This is a singular testimony to the strength of steel. The roadbed has been made as light as possible, but still stiff enough and strong enough to be stable. So we're able to set a whole new benchmark for suspension bridge design. 440 years after Italian explorer Giovanni de Verrazzano discovered the Narrows and New York Harbor, the first bridge across it is named in his honor. This was another symbol of a great city. When you're coming into New York, as a first impression, you want these bridges to be the most spectacular monument as possible. It just seems inconceivable that this thing could stay up. It's one of the really beautiful things about suspension bridges. They do seem truly sometimes to just defy the laws of physics, but it's what makes them so wonderful. On opening day, November 21st, 1964, all of New York City's five boroughs are finally connected. And with an annual capacity of 48 million vehicles, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge is the ultimate commercial artery, linking New York with the rest of America. The city is finally one unified whole. So there's little question in my mind that the five boroughs congealed into one large city we know as New York today directly as a result of finally being physically joined by the bridges. The Verrazano Narrows was the last long span suspension bridge built in New York City. Over the last half century, the engineering challenge in New York has changed. From building new bridges to keeping the old ones standing. As engineers working in New York City, one of our biggest challenges now is the maintenance and rehabilitation of these structures. It's remarkable that so many have served such a long, useful life. The Brooklyn Bridge, well over 100 years. Williamsburg, approaching its 100 years. But the traffic needs in New York City haven't been reduced. It's necessary that these bridges maintain their service to the communities. What we see today is the maintenance of the existing bridges, and rather than tearing down, keeping them in as good a shape as possible, and celebrating the ingenuity of the engineers that created them. So our challenge is to keep them running, and this requires vigilant inspections, rehabilitation, painting. All of these areas are of critical concern in order to keep that infrastructure in place and then allow for the public to travel freely in and around the city. Well, I can imagine there will come a day maybe when bridges have to be replaced, but if we look back 
of other countries, specifically Europe, where you can see bridges that have been around for six, seven hundred years and have been maintained, I think there's a very good chance that the New York City bridges will be along and around for centuries to come. New York's bridges helped make the city as great as they themselves are. And New York would never have become what it is without them. Over the years, four of its suspension bridges have held the title of world's longest. But each one pushed the limits of bridge engineering while tying together portions of a growing city. There's really no other city in the world that you can compare to New York City in the late 19th century and the early 20th century when it came to building bridges. Virtually every bridge that went up around Manhattan was one of the greatest of its time. So it was the proving ground for bridge building in the early 20th century. This is where it happened. Today, the bridges New York built decades, even a century ago, continue to stand as engineering icons, as vital transportation links, as historic landmarks, and testaments to a century of innovation. <laughs>